and welcome to tonight's webinar hosted by North Carolina Wildlife Federation. My name is Shauna and I am a community organizer with NCWF and I'm super excited to have you all here this evening and to be joined here with Dr. Matt Bertone with the NC State Insect Disease of oh, the Insect NC State Disease and Insect, Insect Clinic, excuse me. Um, tonight we will be learning about arthropods and all things creepy crawlies in our house. I'm really excited to see what images Dr. Bertone has for us tonight. Um, but before we jump in, I have a few housekeeping rules to go over. Um, while we are sitting through the presentation, we encourage you to leave comments and questions in the chat box. Um, and there will be time at the end of the presentation where your questions will be read so that they can be answered. Or if you prefer to ask them yourself, you can go to the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen and then I can unmute you and you can ask them yourself. Um, so I don't wanna take up too much time here. I'm going to give this over to Dr. Mapper Tim. Great, thank you. Um, hopefully you can hear me well. Um, and uh, great. So let me share my screen. All right. Well, hopefully everyone is all right with big pictures of arthropods. So kind of the critters, the creepy crawlers that we have around. Um, and uh, basically uh, our homes, even though we think they're kind of sterile or shouldn't have anything in them other than us or maybe our pets, uh, they are home also to arthropods, to things that like to live with us, um, or they just come in and fess our home or do things like that. Um, so today I'm basically going to just go through all the different types of creatures that you might find commonly in your home. Now, this isn't exhaustive uh, because I don't have enough time to talk about everything, uh, but uh, you'll see some of them are just kind of housemates. Others are invaders. Others are accidental. Uh, so there's all different situations where these things might come in uh, to our homes. So uh, let's see. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about some long term housemates. So these are ones that will persist in homes for long periods of time. They'll breed in homes. Uh, they're not necessarily going to be uh, pests or something to be concerned of about, but I'll, I'll mention when things, you know, when these can be uh, uh, pests. Um, but it's also, you know, I should mention too that you know, uh, just being present and a nuisance can be a pest to some people, but really, you know, what I consider pests are things that are directly harming you, your house, your property, or your pets. Um, and so a lot of these things are just existing in the home. They're not harming anyone. Um, and so, yeah. So the first are going to be carp beetles. So these are a group of beetles called Dermestidae, really diverse in homes. I'll show you some of the diversity in a second. Uh, the most common are in the genus Anthrenus. Uh, and that's what we see here. The larvae look like little bottle brushes, and they're feeding on a piece of dog kibble right there. Um, and they feed on all different things, especially protein-rich stuff, but dead insects, hair, wool, feathers, and food products. Uh, so, in fact, many times they're actually doing a cleanup job in the homes. So they're eating kind of hair and dead insects, things like that, although they do leave little, leave little fecal pellets and stuff everywhere, and maybe other people would prefer other services. Uh, but they are there. Uh, they're found in just about every home. And I should preface this by saying we did a, I led a study uh, many years ago, uh, where we searched uh, 50 homes in Raleigh area and looked for all the arthropods we could find. And so these were in 100% of homes and many of the rooms. Um, the adults, the larvae and adults are hairy and scaly. Um, and so they sometimes can cause itching uh, if for sensitive individuals, but they don't bite. So these are kind of just there around the corners. You won't notice them typically unless you're kind of crawling around. But um, there are a few different types here. So like I said, Anthrenus is the common one. This one, you'll see the adults, these little round adults in the spring, oftentimes near windows crawling around because they're looking to get outside to look for flowers. Uh, in nature, these, many of these beetles will live in birds' nests and other, thing, other places where there's detritus to eat, uh, feathers and hair, other mammal nests, things like that. Uh, we also have Trogoderma, which can, ca can contain some stored product pests that eat like cereals and grains. 
Um, and then black carpet beetles have this kind of funky larva that's black with this like kind of these this tail fluff. Um, and like I said, many of the adults are either hairy or scaly. They're actually quite beautiful. And in uh, in fact, the sh the photo I shared uh, for this talk was the adult of a of a varied carpet beetle, uh, which is all around the world. Um, a very fresh, pristine adult that has just uh, developed into the adult. And what they do is they actually live in the adult develops in the last larval skin. So the larval skin is an envelope and the larvae have these special CD that have spear like heads. And they're actually when prey, when predators come and try and get them, they get their mouth gets full of these barbed kind of hairs. So they're like little walking porcupines that eat dead insects and hair and feathers and things like that. Very common in homes. They can sometimes be a pest when they feed on, say, wool products, wool carpets, wool clothing, um, uh, or if they're in stored products. But they are very common in homes. Okay, book lice are another group that will sometimes feed on stored products. I'll show you that in a second. Also dead insects, things like that. Um, but these are very small insects um, with a bulging face, little eyes, and these large hind legs. Uh, you can see how small they are here. This one's resting on the uh, leg of a mosquito, uh, obviously a dead mosquito leg. Um, but they're free living relatives of parasitic lice. Uh, we think that, you know, these things infest bird nests and other nests, mammal nests. And we think that that's where they start to kind of climb up in the fur and then eventually start to become parasitic lice. Uh, but these are not parasites. They don't bite people, uh, but they will live on kind of dead insects, molds. Uh, like stored products. Um, most are wingless in homes, uh, crawl around, and they are very tiny. Like I said, you'll often find them on windowsills and on uh, the um, uh, the boards near the the base, the baseboards of uh, of walls. Um, and uh, just to show you, here's the infestation of them in flour. So they can inf infest flour and uh, rice. Um, but most of the time they're just there. They don't actually feed on those products though. They will, if they get into them, they'll breed in there, but, um, they will typically feed on the, the molds and kind of dead insects, things like that around the house. And so they're persisting, but they're really not doing any harm. Okay. Silverfish are another group and you'll see a theme here, uh, that are, they're fairly primitive insects. Uh, they have these scaly bodies and these three long filaments on their, on their, the tip of their abdomen, very common in homes and other buildings. And they can feed on lots of different items, even paper, leather, glue, uh, and such. I, I have papers in my office that have little holes in them from silverfish. Uh, so you can see this theme where a lot of these things that live in our homes can eat really kind of nutrient poor, resources that you would never think about eating, but they're very happy to do so. So the body is covered in scales, like I said, and uh, this one is a really pretty one. This is very silvery. You can see why it's called silverfish. Uh, here are a couple of different species, the striped silverfish and the gray silverfish. And again, you can see this scaly body. They've got this broad head with these tiny eyes, uh, and they're very common all over the place. Uh, they grow throughout their lives. Uh, like I said, they're... Um, uh, can you still hear me? Sorry. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yeah, there was a weird signal that came up on my computer. Okay, um, but um, so yeah, silverfish are also that they're not fish, obviously, but they are, they kind of look like little fish, honestly, um, but I think they're kind of cute. They're kind of just out there eating stuff, and there's lots of different varieties of silverfish out in the world, uh, out in nature as well, but many of them will live very happily in homes, and there's even one called a fire brat, which is called that because they're often found in like boiler rooms or industrial buildings where it's really hot, and they can survive those temperatures and whatnot. Okay, uh, this one people freak out about a lot, although I will say they're very, they're basically harmless, uh, but I think it's the long legs and the hopping and all that stuff, but camel crickets. So some people call them sprickets, like spider crickets or uh, cave crickets or things like that, or just, oh my gosh, what's that? Uh, but these are large leggy crickets without wings, so they don't actually sing. Um, and they're very often found in garages and um, basements, places like that. You know, they come from cave dwelling ancestors or uh, you know, a lot of the native ones, this one is not a native one, but we have native ones that do live in homes sometimes, but they're often also found outdoors at night in forests and woods. Um, they're scavengers too. So again, the same theme, uh, most often found in basements or crawl spaces, and they prefer some humid environments. 
um, but camel cricket. So, uh, you know, they're, they're there. They're not going to harm anything. Typically, I will say they can jump about 10 times before getting too tired. So if you're brave, you can wait for them to jump and get tired and then collect them in a cup and put them outside or somewhere like that. Um, but, um, but they are harmless, even though they look creepy. Okay, now we're getting into some predators. So these predators obviously feed on other arthropods that are in the home. And so they, um, they have an abundant supply sometimes, especially depending on the home. And so the first are another freaky insect that people hate. In fact, my mom hated these so much when I was younger, and I actually kept them as pets. So that tells you something. Um, the uh, house centipedes are a centipede species not native to the U.S., this one. Um, and although we do have some native ones in the southwest, uh, very leggy. Uh, very different than typical centipedes you find outdoors in that they have compound eyes and they have uh, much longer legs. They actually breathe in a different way. They're kind of separate from other centipedes, uh, but they are still centipedes. Uh, so they do have uh, their front legs like other centipedes are modified into venom claws. And even though this sounds scary and they can get big, about an inch long, uh, they're not harmful to humans. I've never heard of anybody being bitten by them. In fact, they run really fast because they're very uh, scared of people. Uh, but they are kind of like the cheetahs of the uh, arthropod world. Uh, and they like to actually feed on cockroaches and flies. So if you are scared of them, just remember they can be doing a good service. And to prove that, here's one that I fed a German cockroach and it very happily went after it very quickly. And I don't know if you could see here, but they actually, their legs are prehensile. So they can actually wrap these legs around the prey, grab it kind of like whips, and then they go to town on it and they'll just leave. Now they are kind of messy and maybe this will leave food for the carpet beetles and the book lice, but they leave all the hard bits around and kind of eat all the soft bits. Uh, so it's kind of like after you're eating a bunch of chicken wings, you leave all those bones by. So that's uh, these centipedes though are really fantastic hunters. Um, Again, harmless, basically. Uh, they they are really interesting critters out there. Some people call them thousand leggers, I guess, too, which they don't obviously have thousand legs, but uh, they maybe it's a frightened person will count that high. Okay, now spiders. I know a lot of people don't like spiders, but I love spiders. Um, I think they're really amazing animals. I think they're really... They do a lot of good things and they have a lot of really interesting behaviors. Um, so spiders are very common in homes. They can survive long periods without uh, a lot of water. They can survive long periods without food. In fact, some spiders can survive over a year without food. So um, they're very well adapted to living in homes where they may not catch food for a while. Um, and one of the most common groups you're going to find are the cobweb spiders. These are these typically have a very large round abdomen. Uh, they hang in webs that are uh, irregular, so they don't create like an orb web or like a really uh, patterned, nicely patterned web. It's just irregular uh, silk strands all over the place. Typically, the strands go to the floor, and uh, the, they're like trip lines that catch prey that's crawling around. Uh, so these can be good pest control, but spiders and really are in general generalist predators so they're going to eat whatever they can catch and i've even seen some cobweb spiders catch snakes and lizards and things like that and the web basically immobilizes them they've got a fairly strong venom and they can um they can subdue those those large prey items uh they're generally not venomous although uh, or dangerous i should say now almost all spiders have a venom but really with spiders, uh, they don't go around just randomly biting people. If you wake up and you got a little red welt, that doesn't mean a spider came and bit you while you're sleeping. Spiders will only bite when they're defending themselves. And if, say, there is a web somewhere in a space and you grab it, reach your hand in, you press the spider up against your skin, it may bite you in defense because it's threat. It's feeling like its life is threatened. Um, but they spider bites generally resolve fine. There's no issues typically. Uh, although I'll get to a couple in a minute that could be a little bit more uh, potent, potently venomous. But here's a cobweb spider, a common house spider. And uh, there's uh, some other cobweb spiders, triangulate cobweb spider and the false widow. Uh, these are both in the genus Steatoda. Uh, the false widows do look a lot like black widows, but they don't have that red hourglass underneath the abdomen. Uh, but of course, black widows are a type of cobweb spider. Eat also, they are one of the largest cobweb spiders and um, they have um, they um, have a potent venom, though. So it's really only the adult females that have the potent venom. The males and the young ones don't. 
Uh, but these are typically going to be found outdoors. They don't really um, uh, come indoors very often, uh, black widows, but they may be found indoors sometimes. Another one that's close relative, uh, close, close relative is the brown widow. Uh, the brown widow is not native to the U.S., uh, but it's kind of spreading around. Uh, they have this very characteristic spiky egg sac, so they're fairly easy to identify if you have the egg sacs around. Uh, and again, they're brown widow. They're called brown widows because when they, even when they're mature, they are this brown color uh, with kind of an orangish hourglass underneath. They do both species get pretty big. Actually, we have uh, three species here in North Carolina. We have the northern, southern. Northern Black Widow, Southern Black Widow, and Brown Widow. The two Black Widows are actually native. Um, and uh, they can be found around homes too. Now, one of the most common spiders in homes, and in fact, if I look around my basement that I'm in right now, I have lots of them, um, for better or worse. Uh, the, those are the cellar spiders uh, in this family, Full City. Uh, there are, they are among the most common families of spiders in homes. They prefer basements, garages, but can be elsewhere in the house. And they do sometimes feed and often feed on other spiders. They'll actually, even though they're very fragile looking, they will go into other spiders' webs and uh, attack them and eat them. So I don't know what that, you know, what, how I feel about that, because I like spiders in general. But uh, And it's not technically cannibalism, because these are uh, much differently related than the other uh, spiders that we've talked about so far. Um, when you get near them, they sometimes shake their web violently. Uh, that's to freak you out and scare you away, which it probably will a little bit, but they're really just doing that to fake you out because they, their venom is not potent. They really can't even deliver it well to you. And they're very non-aggressive. Um, and this is a big female, uh, here hanging in her web. And here's a male. You can see those very, the two males, you can see those very large, uh, palps in the front. Uh, just a fun fact in male spiders, uh, this is how they deliver their sperm. They actually um, grab uh, sperm from themselves in these front legs, these modified palps, and they use that to deliver the sperm to the female. Um, and you can see, though, actually, this one is being cannibalistic in that it's eating another falsid, probably another cellar spider there. Um, but gangly, harmless to humans, kind of creepy, but, you know, not going to harm you. And they're just really kind of big scaredy cats. Another common spider we find around here, some especially I, I would say in older buildings, I, it seems to be uh, my building uh, shown right here uh, on campus is very old and has a lot of these crevices. So you get these crevice weavers uh, and the specific one that we have here is the Southern house spider. Uh, so the males right here, again, those palps those modified palps. You can see the females have regular leg leg palps. And uh, the females are darker, uh, almost black or dark brown. And the males are kind of lighter with a smaller abdomen. You'll see them when they're typically when they're kind of crawling around um, looking for females. They'll kind of approach the web and kind of uh, play some music on the web and make sure that the female knows he's kind of receptive and not to eat him. And who knows, she can decide what she wants to do with that. Um, but they will live not very long time, but the females can live a long time, even uh, over a decade. Um, completely harmless. These look a lot like brown recluses, but we really don't have brown recluses in North Carolina. Uh, you know, there's there's some places where you can find them, but I would say almost anyone on this call uh, has never seen a wild brown recluse in North Carolina. Um, it's it's there. It's like a mis misnomer that they're there, that they're here. Um, and we could talk about that more later if you want. Um, but there's also lots of other spiders that are around homes and some that like to be in homes, uh, others that are kind of getting there accidentally. These are a lot of these uh, crawling, wandering spiders, kind of. They're all active predators uh, crawling around looking for prey. They can survive in homes for a bit, but they're typically not going to like it in there too much. Um and then around homes, you often see the funnel weavers or grass spiders. They create these sheets with this little uh, tube that they hide in, and uh, they can be on the, right on the outside of homes. And then many people this time of year are also seeing the larger orb weavers out there. So these create that typical cogwheel type web, and they sit in the center upside down uh, for prey to come in. It's it's only this time of year that they start to get mature and biggest, and that's when people see them. Uh, but some people call them barn spiders. Uh, uh, they're also called all different types of orb weavers. Um, but these are often found right around houses, usually on the outside or 
almost always on the outside, very, very rarely on the inside. Okay. So those are just some things that might persist around homes or breed around homes. <laughs> Excuse me. The next ones are ones that might cause infestations. So these are ones you'd probably want to get rid of, or there's some reason they're in your home, but without certain resources or certain reasons, they're not going to be in your home. Um, and so we'll start off with uh, pantry moths. So there are a few types of moths that uh, will, the caterpillars, they're technically caterpillars that are larvae, will feed on stored products. Uh, there are several species that infest food products and even chocolate. Uh, here is a box uh, or a container of mixed nuts, and you can see all the moths flying around there. Somehow one got in there, laid eggs, the larvae hatched, fed on these nuts, and you'll see that in a second, and then began to reproduce in there. Um, and yeah, any, you know, if you ever have a moth or we'll see some of the other, these other stored pest, uh, pests later, if you have any of those, you're really going to be looking for the source, the food source, which is usually something uh, you know, uh, carbohydrate rich, protein rich, or, uh, and depending on the speed, the type of insect or arthropod, what it, what it's going to be feeding on. Um, and this can even include things like I've gotten, uh, this is the Indian meal moth, the most common one. It's got these really beautiful coppery uh, scales with gray and, and lighter ones. Uh, I've even seen this one infesting decorations and um, wristbands and uh, bracelets that are made out of seeds or natural products. So it's not just kind of your food. It could be other natural products. We've seen we've even heard of them infesting bean bags and stuff like that. Things where you wouldn't normally think it's a good food source, but to them, they don't care that it's a bean bag that's used for a game or something like that. Now, here's some of the caterpillars of uh, of the Indian meal moth. And you can see this little caterpillar here. Uh, you can see all the this webbing, the silk, because they're caterpillars that produce silk, uh, like silk moths. Um, and you can see all the fecal matter and the kind of uh, gouges out of this cashew. And here's some bird seed, some, uh, some uh, sunflower seed that's uh, being infested by them. Okay, just like those stored product moths, uh, there are lots of beetles that also uh, infest stored products. There's lots of different groups that have evolved to do this. I, I don't know how many times it's evolved, but I would say probably over a dozen times it's evolved for insects, for beetles to infest these products. And that is when humans started storing products like grains and things like that, saving things, you know, agriculture was starting, uh, people were storing them indoors. That was when these beetles found that, oh, wow. Or also, of course, in nature, birds and rodents will store uh, seeds and stuff. And that's where they probably evolved. But then some species are now only found or mainly found with humans. Um, they can infest spices and dried herbs, also other materials made from plants and seeds, um, and can build up huge populations. In fact, people see them crawling around their house and they don't know where they're from. Uh, and it could be just some source in another room that you wouldn't know, and they they are crawling out there from it. And so here's some examples of some of the beetles that you would find. So uh, here, grain, there's a few species of granary weevils um, that uh, some are flightless and some are flighted. Uh, confused flower beetle is a flightless one, but there's also a species, the red flower beetle, that does fly. Uh, and these feed typically on uh, flour, like broken um, you know, dust from, from grains. They can't eat the whole ones. But then there are other beetles that will bore right into, these are actually relatives of wood boring beetles that will bore right into um, food items like this uh, dog biscuit right here with all these holes in it. Uh, cigarette beetles are a close relative and they'll do this very similar thing. I've seen them in uh, containers of uh, spices and things like that. And grain beetles will do the same thing as well. And these are basically all kind of distantly related from each other. These two are the only close relatives. There's also a lot of mold beetles out there. So these are beetles that don't feed on stored products, but sometimes there are mold blooms in homes and these beetles, their larvae and themselves, they feed on the, the fungus. Um, there are lots of fungus feeding beetles and that's what these evolve from. And so they don't really distinguish much from a mold that's out in nature and one that's in the home. Um, so they can be difficult to tell apart. They all look, we call them little, little brown jobbies or little brown beetles. They all kind of look similar. Um, but uh, but they can be common in homes. And one of the things that people don't realize is that actually we get a lot of complaints when people buy a new home that's just been built, a new apartment that's just been built. 
um, they'll have these beetles infesting it. And they're like, well, this is just built. How can it be dirty? How can it be whatever? Well, what happens is that we figured out, or I haven't, but over the years, people have figured out that the building materials, like the drywall and the wood, things like that, that are being used are still a little bit wet typically. And once you close them up, the inside of the walls kind of have little mold blooms. The, the, the spores from the molds can get in there and they begin to grow. And so you get a lot of these beetles kind of roaming around because there's a good food source and they can access them, but then people are freaking out. And so, yeah, it's uh, it can be a mystery sometimes to people until you understand what the identity is and figure out what they are. Okay, along the same lines, clothes moths. These are a lot like dermestid beetles in that the the caterpillars feed on keratin typically. So they feed on wool, um, uh, horns, and um, dried, you know, and feathers, uh, dry dead insects sometimes. But these are mostly going to feed on keratin-based products. Um, the little moths, they're very tiny. I'll show you in a second. This is a much blown up photo of one. Uh, they have these cute little hairdos almost and really pretty wings the the kind of elongate with this kind of spoon shaped wing um and some of the larvae do make cases in which they live and others create webbing um so this is how big these these moths are so you know when you see people showing talking about closed moths it's not these giant moths that you see out at lights they're gonna be very tiny moths and many of them also live in birds nests and mammal nests too and you can see how they evolve to live in human homes too but here's a case making clothes moth. They actually make their case out of silk and they grab debris and incorporate it in there. So you can see all the little fibers and stuff. And one of my favorites is this is a case making one of a more Southern. This is actually from Peru, from a house in Peru. But you can see it actually incorporated glitter from the home into its case. So they're very artistic too. But very cool little moths, although you wouldn't want one to, them to infest your home, especially if you have wool carpets or wool rugs, uh, wool clothing, things like that, because they will feed on it and create the holes and just destroy the fabric. Ants uh, are really common in homes, of course. I think everybody's probably had some kind of ant visit uh, or infestation. Uh, they are technically social wasps. Uh, the, the workers that you see are all female. Uh, there's a queen in the colony. They will produce also winged reproductives in certain times of the year where the males and females, uh, the males will are wing, always winged. They mate with the females. They die. The female then creates a new colony and you've got new co ant colony. In homes, they're often looking for water and sometimes food um, or they're avoiding water. If it's too wet somewhere, uh, they may come into a house because they're trying to avoid the water or the flooding. Um, and a few will nest in homes or structural wood. And so this is the aptly named little black ant. They're fairly little and small. We have lots of different ants, excuse me, that can be found around homes. One of the most common is the odorous house ant. A lot of people call them sugar ants, or they're kind of a medium-sized, medium-speed ant that um, you can actually identify yourself, not by looking at it, but if you take one specimen, and I know this is gross, but you can crush it. And if you crush it and smell it, it'll smell kind of like they've said uh, rotting bananas or blue cheese. And in fact, uh, there was a guy, uh, a colleague I know who studied the chemical chemistry of their smell and found that it actually does match blue cheese a lot. So they definitely have a distinct odor. Other ants, you wouldn't be able to smell anything. These have this kind of funky odor, uh, but there are carpenter ants too and acrobat ants. Acrobat ants typically nest in kind of roofs uh, and because they're in nature, they're out in trees um, but carpenter ants can be an actual issue. Um, it's really when you've got water damage in the home that these ants move into it. In nature, they're, of course, going to be moving into rotting logs and standing uh, rotting dead trees. And once the wood gets soft enough, they're not actually feeding on the wood, but they're excavating it with their mandibles. They're creating these galleries. Uh, unfortunately, this is my was my house. Uh, luckily, we repaired that. But when I moved in, we had lots of flying ones around the house. Uh, like this. And so we knew that there was an infestation nearby. Um, but in homes, the wood, the wood has to be uh, soft first. So we often see this where there's water damage or rot, some something happening like that. And basically, you have them moving in and creating a nest and the nest persists for some time. Um, so basically, looking for the water damage is the way to uh, get rid of them keeping water water from damaging the wood is the best thing uh but you obviously have to replace structural wood because they make it into like swiss cheese 
Other carpenter ant species sometimes nest in the voids of walls, but they're not going to be excavating the wood like the black carpenter ant, which is probably the most destructive one around. Okay, now a few flies. Uh, flies are one of my favorite groups. Um, not many people can say that, I guess. But uh, the first group are the moth or drain flies. These, uh, these flies look like small fuzzy moths. Uh, they kind of crawl up uh, bathroom walls and, and places like that. Uh, that's because their larvae, these worm-like things with this kind of siphon on the back and these plates on their back, uh, they live in the muck at the bottom of pipes. They also, uh, there are other species that live in compost and tree holes, but the larvae are kind of worm-like and just kind of feed off that muck in the bottom of pipes. So um, they can sometimes come out, especially in uh, in bathrooms and places where you have plumbing uh, and a plumbing issue maybe or build up. Uh, but luckily they're harmless. They're really just a sign that there's some build up there in the pipes. Um, the one time I saw them was we had a, a shower that was leaking. So we put it out of commission. I basically taped over the drain, but there was still water in there and it sat so long that it built up really nice organic matter. And these, I could see a lot of these larvae in there. Um, but they're harmless flies. Uh, now, there are certain ones in this group of, of this family psychotity that can be harmful, but the ones you find in your homes are not. Uh, you may also have darkwing fungus gnats. These are uh, a gnat, like I said, but they, they have these worm-like larvae that live in soil, uh, but they also are very commonly found in houseplants. So the soil, the potting soil of houseplants, if it's overwatered or kept too wet, it grows fungus, the organic matter starts to decay. These things are going to eat all that organic matter, the fungus. Uh, in greenhouse situations, they can actually harm the plants sometimes, but most of the time in homes, they're just a nuisance. They're really just kind of a sign that especially you, they, they will go off to compost too, but in a home, we typically see them associated with house plants and overwatered house plants. But they are also harmless. They're just a nuisance. Um, and a lot of people know this one, fruit flies, or actually what I call, or, or a lot of entomologists call vinegar flies to distinguish them from true fruit flies that actually attack live fruit on trees. These little brown or yellow flies that kind of hover around in kitchens and stuff, I think most people are probably familiar with them a little bit. They are being attracted to some kind of rotting or fermenting uh, vegetable matter, uh, including fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. And so when these these uh, this vegetable matter rots, uh, it supports a whole group of microorganisms like yeasts and bacteria. And these flies, their larvae feed on that. They don't actually feed on the fruit itself. Um, and so because they, they're attracted to this fermentation, the vinegar, uh, that's why we call them vinegar flies, also sometimes pomace flies. But this is also a reason that sometimes if you're drinking a beer or wine, you'll have these flies flying around it because they think that that's a site for their larvae to live. Um, and they're also a good genetic model organism. They're a really famous group of, in, of flies, uh, but um, they can be common in homes sometimes. Now, one that you probably don't want to see, although they don't bite, luckily, but they can be a severe nuisance, are scuttleflies. Uh, these are associated with lots of different organic matter. In fact, Megacelia scalaris, this species right here, uh, is probably one of the most biologically diverse animals on Earth. Their larvae can develop in all different types of substrates, from fungus to live plant material to decaying uh, plant material, to sewage and dung, to dying insects, and even they've been found in formaldehyde, paint, and shoe polish. So they're super hardcore. Um, and so, you know, when we see uh, infestations in homes, we typically think there might be a sewage problem, a dead animal, rotting vegetable matter, something in there for their larvae to feed on. Um, and uh, they often run along surfaces in an erratic jerking motion. And that's why they're called scuttleflies. They rarely actually even fly. They'll fly around a little bit, but they often kind of run along the surfaces really quickly. Okay, cockroaches, everyone's favorites. Um, so this is a diverse group with a few household pests, but many of the species in the world are not pests at all. They're just out in nature. Uh, but some species can attain high numbers in homes and can be really serious pests because some of these actually can produce, they will produce proteins in their guts when they defecate, those proteins aerosolize, and you, they can cause asthma and some other health issues. 
Um, so this is a German cockroach with her carrying her egg sac or egg case called an Uthika. Um, and here's another one with the babies around. So the German cockroach is small, straw colored, less um, about a half an inch with these two black stripes. You do not want to see those in your home. Those, if they are in your home, you want to get, uh, get call a pest control company or buy some gel baits, things like that. They are a really bad species to have around. And they are really only found in human homes. They won't, you won't find them out in the wild. Uh, in industrial buildings or in college campuses, sometimes you'll find brown bandits, cockroach, another species that can be a real pest. And then a larger species, the American cockroach, can be also a pest in certain situations. Uh, but, excuse me, the one I see the most in my home, and I see a lot of them because I live in the woods, and down here in the south, you're going to get smoky brown cockroaches, aka palmetto bugs, aka water bugs, uh, which is a non-native species, but has been here forever large reddish brown species uh the young are black and white striped um they are luckily they are not a species that infests homes over a long period they can't survive in how dry our homes are that's why you often find them i often find them under my sink or under the dogfish bowl or dogfish, the the dog water bowl and um basically areas where they can get a lot of moisture they can they can replicate what's outside because they want to be outside and they feed on kind of compost they're de good decomposers but uh, they do get in homes sometimes accidentally, but just know that they don't want to be there. They are not very happy to be in the home. It's too dry. There's not enough, uh, you know, stuff for them to eat. Okay, let's move on to a couple parasites. So everybody loves parasites, right? Things that suck blood. Uh, and the two main ones I'm going to talk about are first fleas. Uh, and so fleas um, will attack pets, of course, and they will bite humans uh, when when they're infesting pets, too. But uh, they can't survive on human blood long term, uh, even though there is a human flea. We you know, people don't get fleas out of nowhere. It's usually it's associated with dogs and cats. And in fact, the common uh, species we have is actually the cat flea, even the one on dogs. Um, they're very small, wingless insects. They jump really well. And uh, they're flattened side to side. Um, and uh, they are, they can be a severe nuisance, a real irritation to pets and humans. They can also transmit parasites. So here's the fecal matter of a, of a flea. They're larvae or worm like larvae, uh, uh, immatures that live in kind of the carpet or, or floor, and they'll eat the adult flea feces and other de debris. But uh, this is actually the segment of a tapeworm. And so fleas are the host of tapeworms. So when uh, pets are grooming themselves, they're licking themselves, they ingest a flea. That flea maybe uh, has the eggs of a tapeworm in it. The pet then can get a tapeworm. Then out of the rear end, you, they shed these uh, units that then are fed on by the young fleas and then pass through the cycle. So this is where they can also be a huge issue, obviously. So it's not just the biting and the nuisance, but it's the transmission of parasites potentially. And of course, humans can it too. So just don't eat any fleas out there, I guess. Uh, it's probably not going to be good for you. Now, another really creepy and gross thing is a, a bed bug. These are true bugs, so they're related to stink bugs, uh, but they feed on blood. Uh, and the, the bed bug, Cymex tularius, is specific to humans. It, doesn't, it will feed on uh, chickens and other animals, but it's really the only one around here that will feed on humans. There's a tropical bed bug, too, uh, that feeds on humans. But um, you can see this one uh, feeding and it's uh, you know, uh, you're basically filling up on blood. They're digesting that. That's all they live on. They don't have wings. They don't jump. They only live near humans. Um, and they can sustain huge populations in homes and can be very difficult and expensive to control. So they're really a serious pest. They're becoming, the, you know, if this was 20 years ago, I wouldn't have been talking about it at all because they're so rare. Uh, they were so rare, but they have made a huge resurgence and they are now fairly common. Luckily, they don't cause tra uh, transmit diseases, um, but they can cause severe irritation, obviously. It should be noted that different people react differently. Uh, I've actually fed them on myself a couple of times and I didn't actually react, but there are people that react really badly. Um, and I guess you can't predict until you know, until you have experienced them. Uh, but here is what a typical kind of group of bed bugs look like. So you're going to find a lot of fecal matter, uh, eggshells, uh, shed skins, uh, and different life stages. You get the really young ones, the very old ones, and they're just 
eating and pooping and gross and everything everywhere. Now, there are some co close relatives of the bed bug that will live around homes as well, but these are going to be feeding on animals near the home or in the home. And when the animals are gone, they may sometimes come and bite humans. So we have, for instance, the bat bug. It looks a lot, it's very close relative to the bed bug, it's, except it's much hairier. These only feed on bats and they come into the main part of the house when the bats are gone. Uh, for that, you have to actually wait till the bats are gone, exclude them from your attic, and that will help effectively basically control them. Uh, you have things like the swallow bug found on swallows, which are a type of bird, and the chim chimney swift bug, which is found on chimney swifts, which uh, live in, in chimneys now because we tore down a lot of their trees that they used to live in. So now they mostly live in human houses. So um, these can also be bugs that can irritate humans but won't live on humans for long term. Okay, and finally, uh, we'll talk about a couple of seasonal home invaders. And this is perfect timing because this is the time of year where when the days get shorter and it starts to get cooler, there are insects that are, as adults, will hibernate or overwinter, and then they resume their activity in the spring, begin mating, laying eggs. Um, and so they need to find, they're active, so they're going to find a place to overwinter. And unfortunately, uh, our homes are a good place for that. So the first one and probably one of the more common ones that invades homes are stink bugs, especially this species, the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, the brown marmorated stink bug has only been in the U.S. since about, I think, 1998, uh, but it's kind of spread across most of the U.S., it has become an agricultural pest, but the nuisance pest status is really uh, big, too. And a lot of people, these can inundate homes. Um, in nature, they're going to, all of these things are going to really, in nature, uh, hibernate in leaf litter, under bark, in excluded places. But our homes, now that we've replaced nature in a lot of places, our homes are going to be the thing that they have to kind of find. find and they're going to crawl up on the house and get inside. Um, so they come through gaps and cracks and holes in the exterior. Um, they're not dangerous, um, and they can be vacuumed up or collected in soapy water, but uh, they do stink a bit. I would say they're not terribly bad smelling. Uh, I think they smell, um, and you can try it when next time you find one, just grab one and see if it'll uh, excrete, you know, secrete this uh, odor. But I think it actually smells more like sour apple than anything, or people say cilantro. It's kind of, it's not terribly bad, but it's also very pungent. So anyway, these uh, these uh, stink bugs can come into homes in huge numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. Ladybugs will also do that. So I know that people love ladybugs. They're really pretty. Um, but ladybugs can do that and can become an extreme nuisance and even worse than stink bugs, I would say, in some respects. Um, very often it's the multicolored Asian lady beetle, uh, or ladybug harmonia axiridis, but a couple other species will do it. Uh, this species is the most common, I would say in North Carolina, it's not native, um, and, but it was kind of used as biocontrol by people. And then it just went crazy. Um, but they can be quite abundant. And the thing that makes them even worse than stink bugs, I would say is that they can stain the skin. Uh, so they reflex bleed out of their joints, and this can cause staining and, and irritation sometimes in humans. But they can also bite humans uh, and bite pets. Uh, I have actually been bitten by a ladybug once, and it was no joke. They they It's a very sharp pinch, and they're predators, so they're they're good at biting. So I don't think I wouldn't say it's always going to happen, but they they are known to bite uh, in certain occasions. Um, social wasps too. So these are not only found around the homes a lot, but in the winter, the mated queens will look for hibernation spots because while the rest of the colony dies out and the males die out, the mated queens will hibernate so that in the, in the spring they can emerge and very quickly start a new nest and then they will be replaced by their workers and new queens later on in the year. So these include things like paper wasp or paper wasps or umbrella wasps that create these paper nests on the eaves of houses and around houses, and even hornets like this European hornet, these very large wasps. And these groups of wasps, you probably know, like yellow jackets, hornets, and paper wasps, they collect uh, wood uh, to make pulp, little, little, they kept collect bits of pulp and or wood and mix it with saliva to make pulp. And they create these nests either uh, under the eaves of houses or near houses uh, in trees and cavities, and even European horns will create sometimes in attics, very large paper nests. 
And uh, some like yellow jackets actually create the paper nests underground. Uh, and so all of these can be found around homes. But again, you'll often see them in the fall when they are coming indoors. But I should mention, too, with all these that are overwintering, you will then also see another uh, period of activity in the spring when it starts to warm up and they become active and they're going out to leave and get back into nature. There's all these other invaders, too. So millipedes, flies, isopods, you know, roly polies, sow bugs and others that will either come into overwinter like these cluster flies or they will invade homes when they're flooding outside. So they can't live in the water. They they retreat from it and they'll enter homes accidentally. Um, so basically the best thing you can do is make sure gaps around those areas uh, are, are fixed. You don't have a lot of ways for these things to get in, but just know that a lot of these things that come in are either hiding from something they don't like, or they're just you know there for a brief period of time. And really these things, uh, the millipedes and the isopods, really can't survive in the dry uh, conditions of the home. And so there's basically a death wish for them. They they dry out very quickly. And that's why you often find them just dead everywhere or they're getting eaten by spiders or other things around. So it's really not a great situation for them either. So be kind to them, uh, you know, maybe move them outside if you can uh, when the conditions are better or whatnot, but they are not really wanting to come in your home if they have to. Uh, and that's also the same for clover mites. We do get in the spring, we get sometimes these little mites that people squish and they see red blood and they think, oh, something's bit me or whatever. It's actually the mite's blood. So, you know, think about that. But these little mites uh, will feed on plants and they'll crawl around and come into homes. And this is what they look like actually on like a white surface. So um, so all these things will enter homes uh, either accidentally by avoiding, you know, either they're avoiding something, they're just running around and they accidentally come in the home and they can't get out. Or they are looking out, looking for your home to be a place where they can kind of sleep and rest over over the winter and in bad conditions. Um, so it's probably a lot. Uh, there was, you know, try to get back, through it uh, quick enough so that we could have time for questions. And so now we, I will open up for questions. Um, so we have a few questions already. Uh, we have somebody with their hand raised. So let's see. Um, Karen, if you'd like to ask your question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like. Yeah, or I can I can read them if we if you'd like to. It's uh, okay. I have the, both Q and A and chat open. So would, okay, would great. Be... I don't. Maybe she didn't mean. To, maybe they didn't mean to raise their hand. So. Um, okay. Yeah, we can go ahead and read. The oh, it looks like there's just two questions. Um, I don't think there's anything else in the chat except for your uh, information. Um, so I will, and we, you know, feel free to ask more questions if you want. But I have uh, one where it says, "Is it possible to get rid of carpet beetles from your house?" Well, I would say that um, you can probably try to get rid of all of them, but it's going to be very difficult. I would say in low numbers, you know, one here, or there, you're not going to notice them. And really, unless there's uh, material that they can feed on, they're not going to be feeding on anything important. So um, there's really not a need to get rid of them uh, and spend your time and money to try. Really, chemicals are not going to help. And you really don't want to expose yourself to all those things indoors. Uh, vacuuming, keeping, you know, I would say if you have items like uh, wool, clothing, or things that you want to protect, you can just uh, vacuum seal them or seal them in a bag, uh, making sure, you know, put them in a, in a tub that can keep them from getting exposed to the carbon beetles. But you would know if you have a big population of them, you'll see a lot of shed skins and whatnot. You'll see adults in the spring on the windowsills. But like I said, we searched 50 homes and 100% of the homes had them. And I would say they're just about in every room. But the thing is, nobody, you know, the fact that you don't really know much about them or you haven't maybe haven't come in contact with them or most people is because they're so small and they're kind of doing their little thing and they're not harming anything. So it's really a kind of cost benefit thing. You could technically go around your whole entire house and collect every single carpet beetle you can find a vacuum every day, everywhere, all the time. And maybe you'd get all of them, but it's not really worth it, let's just say. Um, and then another question from the same person is, uh, how do you evict fungus gnats from your plants? Well, so the best method is to not water them so much. So they can't survive in dry conditions. 
And so um, the plants also probably don't want to be watered so much. And so if you can find that balance, that's probably the best thing. Uh, there are also um, some biologicals that you can add to there, but you know, uh, you can also put out yellow sticky traps near your plants and that can, when the, the gnats are attracted to it, they get stuck to it and they die. Um, I will say, I should mention too, that I'm not an expert on control. I just do identification and talk about these things. And, and, um, but once you know what you're dealing with, you can read a lot of resources online. I would definitely suggest going to university resources, uh, and expert resources rather than, you know, others, uh, that might not be as accurate. Okay. So I'm going to go over to the chat because I see, I saw some of these pop up next, uh, are harvesters the same as daddy long legs? So that's, um, it's a funny thing about common names. So some people call cellar spiders, those true spiders that I showed earlier, the really long legged ones, daddy long legs. Um, but daddy long legs and harvesters or harvest men or uh, harvest people, um, they are a spider relative. They're an arachnid, but not an actual spider. You'll know to them because uh, in the wild, they have kind of like a ball-like body and then all these little hair-like legs coming off them. They Those are completely harmless. They don't have any venom. They can't harm anyone. Uh, they're scavengers typically, um, whereas the cellar spiders are a true spider. They have venom, but it's not potent or not, you know, they're not really aggressive or able to deliver it. Um, and they live typically in the home in webs. And then to compound it, uh, crane flies or mosquito hawks or those big gangly flies in Britain, they call those daddy long legs. So there's a lot of confusion sometimes about what people are talking about. Uh, but those are the the harvestmen or the daddy long legs that most people think of are outdoor arachnids that are not actual true spiders. Um, we have a next one, daddy long legs. Love them when I was growing up as a child. Yeah, so they're great. They're very, they're they're really great to show kids because they are harmless. Uh, they kind of tickle a little bit. They're a little freaky looking, but they're really kind of just completely harmless. They're they're kind of uh, just cool arachnids that are out there. And there's some really interesting ones. We even have some species that we would consider more tropical looking. They've got thicker legs and kind of more robust bodies. Um, but, um, and I could show you one later if you want. Um Okay, let's go to this one in the chat. Some of your potted plants come infested with the fungus gnats. That could be true. Yeah, if you buy it, if you have, if the pot plant is already potted, um, the the soil could have the fungus gnats in it already. In fact, they they can be a big greenhouse pest uh, where they're really commonly breeding in that. Um, so just make sure, yeah, you're kind of making sure that you're moderating the water. Don't go too much um, if it's if it's dry enough uh, for them not to develop, but the, for the plant to survive. You're probably doing a good job. Um, what's the, a more common home invader? American cockroaches, Smoky Brown. I would say around here, uh, American cockroaches are fairly rare. Uh, in our house study, I think we found one home that had them in it, but 75% uh, of homes had Smoky Browns in them. In fact, my house always has a lot of Smoky Browns. Every once in a while, I get a, a wood roach. Uh, which are outdoor species. They don't want to be in homes either. Uh, again, if you live in the woods around here, you're going to have smoky browns. It's just, you know, palmetto bugs are part of the South living down here. Um, in fact, I, a funny story is when I, when I was younger, my, my family, we went, took a, a trip to Hilton Head, uh, South Carolina, and I had just gotten a tarantula and I was super excited. I brought the tarantula with me. And uh, then when I got to South Carolina, I went outside and this, I was living up in Pennsylvania at the time. So didn't see any of this stuff. And I went outside and all these giant palmetto bugs were running around. And I was like, oh, my God, look at these things. So I caught one and I put it in the cage with the tarantula and the tarantula just huddled in a corner and was afraid of this thing. Uh, but you don't have to be afraid of them. In fact, my daughter loves cockroaches. She kind of saves them from our house. So any little one or medium sized one or whatever, she'll grab and put them outside. And I'll do the same thing because honestly, uh, they're harmless. Uh, they make more of a mess if you squish them to clean up. And so I just grab them and they'll be happy if you put them outside because they're just going to be dead anyway. You're going to have to clean up a dead cockroach anyway. And they don't have those, the, they don't cause the allergens. They don't build up high populations. Uh, they really are just there accidentally. And so it's, I guess it's a fortunate thing that the most common cockroach around here is going to be one that's not a pest. It's not, it's just a nuisance and an accidental invader. 
Um, okay, so let's see. Last question. Why did I always have a crane flies in my house bathroom over the summer? Uh, that I'm not sure. Um, it's hard to say. A lot of crane flies are attracted to lights. So that's one way to keep uh, flies and other insects, certain insects away from your home is just to turn off the lights at night. And in fact, uh, if you can do it, it's a really important uh, thing for nature. So especially one of the worst things to do is to keep lights on all night into the, the daylight. Uh, what happens is moths, uh, you know, natural, just kind of wild moths out there uh, will get attracted to the lights. They'll sit at the light. And if it becomes daylight before they know to go somewhere and hide, uh, they'll get eaten by birds. And so it's actually a really good thing to turn off your lights before the morning so that those moths then have a chance to go hide out in nature and not get eaten. Um, and also just light pollution is bad for insects anyway. It's It traps them in places. Uh, it's good for the spiders that like to live near the lights, but it's not good for the insects themselves. So, you know, I really love that our neighborhood is really dark at night. I mean, you know, you got to worry about other things too, but, you know, uh, we live in the woods, it's dark, but we got lots of critters around and it's kind of what I like. So you just got to get used to some of the things around where you are. Um, but yep, yep, that could be why, but also definitely, you know, if you ever have um, something you don't know what it is, or you're not quite sure of the ID, uh, that's the service that we provide, that my lab provides, and I'm the entomologist, so I'd be looking at those pictures. And if you take a picture and submit it to our lab, uh, I can tell you what it is, tell you whether it's going to be a problem, and we can get somebody to give you advice on what to do. Um, do the cockroaches come in through the actual plumbing or around it? Do they carry um, E. coli on them? So now, in you know, if there is a plumbing issue, you can get insects that come in that way and then come up through drains and whatnot. Um they're not, especially with water traps and things like that in toilets and in sinks, they're not going to be coming up from there, the sewers typically. Really around here, again, most commonly you're going to be getting the smoky browns, which are outside in the leaf litter. They are there. They can be abundant in sewers because that's kind of a nice, warm, moist place. They have lots of food to eat. Uh, but most there's plenty of leaf litter, plenty of organic matter outside, plenty of humidity for them to live here in North Carolina outdoors very happily. And then they do come in just in gaps and cracks. They, you know, I think in my house too, we have a drop ceiling in one area in the basement. I think they get in, you know, on the ground floor and then kind of go up in there and stuff. They'll squeeze their way through. That's the problem though, is that they have a hard time finding their ways out. And so once they get into the house or they're very small and they kind of develop in the house and get too big to get out, that's when you end up finding them dead or finding them kind of huddled around places where they can survive because they're just not happy in the home. They're, they're, they'd much rather be outside. German cockroaches, on the other hand, if you get an infestation in them, they're going to be very happy to live in your home and will not want to go outside. And those usually come in from, if you're living in an apartment, they come in from neighbors or nearby apartments that have an infestation. If it's not treated, they start to spread around from there. Uh, or you bring in something infested and they live there. But we, in our study, we found really no German cockroach. I think we found maybe one, but we, they're very uncommon in many situations, but can be very abundant in certain situations. Um, let's see. Uh, are spiders happy inside? I would say some are, some are very happy inside. So if you see a spider in a web in your home, and hanging out and just kind of there for long term and it's getting food, then it's pretty happy. Uh, that's kind of all they want. Um, and they wouldn't be in our homes if, if it wasn't for that. Uh, and many of these spiders are actually not native. So they're kind of those cellar spiders. The, a lot of the cobweb spiders are not native to here. And they, so they're really good at living with humans. Um, and so they'll, they'll live their entire life here in the home. Uh, other spiders, like this one right here, actually, on this is a door frame in my house. This is the, one of those grass or funnel web spiders. They won't survive in homes very well. They're going to want to be outside. Now, they can build their web right on the outside of the house and be perfectly happy. But there's for these, they're probably not enough food. They're more mobile. Uh, so the more active a spider is, the more energy it's got to burn, the more food it needs. But these web building spiders that can often just sit there motionless, they can survive for a long period of time in the home and they're pretty happy doing it. Um, so yeah, that's the big thing. Like, should you let them out or not? I would say, you know, 
any of them you could let outside and they'll be fine outside. Now, if it's really cold outside, like freezing and stuff, they could die, of course, because they're not going to be happy with that temperature. Um, but, um, but you know, if you're when in doubt, just let it outside. Um, you know, and there's the, always those ways to safely remove spiders. You know, you can put a cup over it, slide a piece of paper or some kind of cardboard underneath and just bring it outside. Spiders are, I would say, you know, spiders are very, um, even though they look, kind of creepy and foreign to us they're really intelligent animals i would say and they're really kind of they get actually attacked and eaten by a lot of things and they're not as scary to other things as they are to us and so they are fairly wary of people they're wary of things they don't want to attack anyone that's why spiders always run away I mean, there might be a couple in the world that don't run away, but uh, but most of the spiders you find are not at all don't want to mess with you. They are they're happy to kind of live their lives and they're very delicate, too. Uh, and so they're very easily killed. And so they they want to avoid humans as much as they can. We're not food to them. There's no reason for them to bite us or use their venom, which it's costly to make venom. And so they um they they don't want to use that venom unless they have to so i would say yeah spiders are one of those things that the actual dangers from them and also but then uh is is almost uh, uh indirectly proportionate to how much people hate or fear them because they just happen to look bad i think i think that they've got a bad look unfortunately although there's some really beautiful spiders out there some really amazing ones um and uh and i definitely Whenever I have people are afraid of them, I, I just suggest you kind of find a spider, just kind of sit by it for a little bit and look at it because you'll see they're not jumping out at you. They're not like trying to get you. They're very shy and, and it can be really interesting too. people. I know I used to feed them when I was younger, just kind of get little insects and throw them in the webs with them. And you can see them doing their work and building webs and great architects and just really kind of cool organisms They're You know, I, I think they're pretty amazing. So, Yeah um any last questions yep charlotte's web yep that's uh exactly like that that movie did a lot for spiders i think and there's you know there's you know spiders i can see why they're creepy and honestly i would not want a spider the size of my dog because then it would eat me because they can take down prey much bigger than them so if we had big spiders around that were eating people yeah i'd say okay this is probably not the best thing to have but we are they know pretty well that we are not we are not anything to be really messed with and we are much more dangerous to spiders than they are to us. So, okay. Thank you so much for that awesome talk. Um, Mm -hmm. Yes, it was a really great presentation. Oh, I think someone has one last question. Would you like to answer that before we wrap up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so spiders uh, can eat invasive pests, but they also, it's, you know, it's kind of uh, spiders are one of those things where they're going to eat anything. And so anything they can they can uh, actually tackle and take down, they're going to eat because they 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 can't just, you know, we we're easy. We can go out to the grocery store or whatever. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's easy for us to get food. But for spiders, they have to figure out when their next meal is. And so they'll eat anything. So spiders can be beneficial when they're eating pests, but they can also eat things like hummingbirds and, uh, you know, and uh, uh, bees and whatnot, things that people think of as beneficial. So they're just going to eat whatever they can. Um, but um, but yeah, luckily, it's not people or pets or anything like that. So um, even the biggest spiders are are, are not going to be able to eat us. So yeah. Well, if you see any of these things in, just let me know. If you have any ever have any questions about what something is, you can always uh, contact me and uh, see, and I'll let you know. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that amazing talk and all of the great pictures. Um, yeah. I definitely didn't realize how many of the insects have really cool patterns. Um, yep. They just take a good, yeah. So they just take a good photo of something. And that's, that's always what I've been into. I always read books when I was younger of them and looking at the photos. And, and so, yeah, I should mention that most of those are my photos. Uh, almost all the ones in my, in the talk are my photos that, you know, I just enjoy getting up close and taking photos. And, you know, when they're like a little speck on the ground, people don't care. But when you blow it up and show them like how cute or beautiful or even creepy they are, you know, it's, it's a little bit more impactful and, or if you can see the scales on a silverfish and and see how pretty they are, it's yeah, yeah. No, it definitely does change your perspective a little bit. 
So, yeah. but thank you, thank you so much. Course, um, I'm sure everyone enjoyed this as much as I did. Um, mm -hmm. this webinar has been recorded, and we will send it out. So, if anybody is that is watching would like to share it with a friend, feel free. Um, and yes, we will have another webinar November 2nd. So if you enjoyed this one, please make sure you tune back in again. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks for the invite. Yes, thank you for coming. So.